Paranormal Dimensions is fortnightly on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. Any opinions or comments made by any guest are their own, and they do not necessarily reflect any of the presenters' or network's opinions. It hasn't changed in millions of years. But here, here we have a clue to an answer. The instruments here are going crazy. I think what we've been suspecting all along may already be happening, Doctor. I'm almost sure of it. Get into your choppers and head north immediately. Don't stop for a thing. Hello, this is Michael Feely, and you're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, the UK's biggest paranormal network, and this is Paranormal Dimensions with David Young. It's going to be definitely interesting, something you don't want to miss. Hello, and welcome to the show. Welcome to a new season of Paranormal Dimensions. I have to tell you that Paranormal Dimensions will be every two weeks now rather than every week. Hopefully it won't upset too many of you. Some of you might even be pleased. Anyway, thank you for that introduction, Michael. And Michael will be back shortly. We've got a, a double guest bill today with James Welsh and Michael Feely, both discussing um, really about the ancients. Now, as you know, I've had um, James Welsh on recently. He had a book out called Corroborating Evidence. And, of course, Michael Feely has had several books out, um, two of which I've got in front of me, Alchemy of the Gods and The Ancient Code, A Serpent Fire. Um, now, as you know, you know, or you may not know, Michael is very well known for his um, decoding very many ancient codes. Now, I was having a chat with um, James a little while ago. Um, he's told me several things about some work that he's been doing um, in that direction, and I thought it a really good idea to put the two of them together on this show and uh, see what comes out of it. Um, it does sound very exciting what James has been coming up with, and um, I'm sure that um, James and Michael will have a, a really good conversation about it, and I hope we all get something out of it. Uh, I, I always get something out of the shows, so um, hopefully you will too, and hopefully they will too. But um, just before we go into all of that, um, of course, as always, if you'd like to get in touch with me at any time, my email address is davidyoung2qn at yahoo.co.uk. That's davidyoung2qn at yahoo.co.uk. I've got some great guests coming up. On this occasion, may I introduce Michael Feely and James Welsh. Hello, James and Michael. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, how are you doing? Welcome. <laughs> Hello, James. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, uh, as I, I don't believe that uh, Michael and James actually know each other or have spoken before, but um, James meet Michael, Michael meet James. Hey, Dan. Hello, James. Sounds like the Waltons. But, uh, <laughs> well, I've got, I've got to introduce <laughs> you somehow. Um, <laughs> now, now, Michael, James... Uh, James has been talking to me off here a little bit about, um, he's, he's, he had a book out a few years back, I was talking about 2015, was it James? 2014, yeah. 2014, 15, whatever, yeah. yeah. Now we did a show a little, a few, a couple of months ago, and obviously I've, I've had you on the show as well, also Michael, a couple of shows ago, uh, well a few shows back anyway, and I, I actually, when James was telling me about, he believes he's made a, a, quite a lot of discoveries about the pyramids. Now, immediately I thought, oh, this would make a great show to have Michael on as well to, to actually d discuss it. Now, James hasn't told me all of his um, uh, discoveries as such, but I thought it would be great to maybe listen to what James has discovered 
and then or, or, or you know his beliefs in what he has discovered and then sort of get your viewpoint on it michael how does that sound that sounds very good uh so that's that's a good i'm most interested yeah so there you go james if you'd like to kick off and uh you know start where, oh, well, wherever yeah. you'd like I'll... to start I mean, you, you might like to give Michael a little bit of background as to your book and everything, um, and also you, your other little discoveries about the space station and everything. Um, I'll just sit back and listen to you. <laughs> so, back and enjoy the book. Um, <laughs> there you go. Off you okay, go. Well, Wait. Myself, um, I've always been fascinated with Egypt ever since I was a wee kid. I know I was, I was totally, you know, uh, loved the place. Uh, I actually went to Egypt uh, for the millennium after having a, a dream directly after a UFO encounter. Um, subsequently, I've been to Egypt three times now. And um, I was actually fortunate enough to, to give a tour around the Great Pyramid uh, the last time I was in Egypt. Sorry, the second time I was in Egypt. I gave a tour around the Great Pyramid and I also gave a tour around the Watson Museum, which was quite, <laughs> which was uh, unexpected. I just had people following me, basically, and I was talking, you know, so um, that was quite good. But this year, uh, I went back and um, I've made some interesting wee discoveries, uh, but I'm not sure how many of them are legit, but some of them are quite eye-opening. But I know for a fact that I've made a archaeological connection between uh, um, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey uh, with Egypt and Easter Island uh, and I'll be releasing the, the information on that in December in my book. I mean it's really short, all it is is uh, comparisons against carbons and hieroglyphs and stuff like that but the same thing repeats itself um, through Gobekli Tepe right through Egypt, uh, Easter Island tablets uh, um, and Egypt itself so there's a common connection there and I've never heard about it anywhere um, so I think I'm the first to, to come across this and um, I think it's quite tantalising um, so I'm, I'm putting that out there in December um, it may already be well known by academia but if not then uh, I've maybe stumbled onto something so that, there's that um, and I also made connections this year with the internal functions of the Great Pyramid and the Grand Gallery and came to some conclusions as to what the Great Pyramid was actually being used for. Um, at that, as well as Stonehenge and other uh, Neolithic sites. So um, that was all very interesting, um, which really blew my mind, actually, uh, through the summer with regards to just how far advanced the, the ancient Egyptians were. Not even, not just the ancient Egyptians, but obviously that seems to be the epicentre, I feel like, of it all. Um, yeah, they were definitely far, far more advanced than we have been led to believe or has been shown to us by the British Museum or anyone else. It's all been covered up. So that's, that's my belief. That's, that's where I'm at with it, Michael. No, absolutely. I, ironically, uh, it's the same thing that, that I've discovered as well. And in terms of Gobletech in Egypt and Stonehenge, I've even uh, basically connected the whole of the ancient world and saw down the city on Mars and different monuments on different planets to the epicenter, which is Egypt. I've also connected pretty much the whole of the Bible to the Giza Plateau because... The Giza Plateau is the original Bible in stone. So yes, uh, when you I'm, not, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you because I know how right you are. Um, yeah, I made uh, I, I, there's a couple other connections I made with the Great Pyramid this year. I totally forgot about there, which you just you just rang that bell for me, and I've just been reminded of that. I mean, there was honestly to be honest with you, Michael, there was that much going on with me this summer. Um, it was hard for me to keep up with the amount of discoveries that I was actually making. My my brain was racing at 10,000 miles per hour for like six weeks, and it was exhausting. It was exhausting. I had to keep lying down. So things would hit me, and I would have to lie down for a while and try and recover. Um, but yeah, um, you're right what you're saying about uh, 
that you know the the the, the Garden of Eden and all this carry on, and Egypt uh, being the epicenter with the the Bible and uh, yeah, uh, the blood of Christ and the body of Christ and all this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it gets kind of quite deep. Um, I only tap into so much of it in my new book because it really stems on. Um, it's more focused on what's been happening uh, mainly this year with the Pentagon UAP report, which was published on the 25th of June, um, which was another total whitewash. Um, and I think that my research has shown um, that basically it was all part of a big massive psychological operation to um, convince the world that UAPs were not connected to uh, alien spacecraft or alien civilizations per se. Um, so the whole the whole song and dance uh, with all the leaks that came out this year is all complete theatre uh, just for the public to, to downplay um, what was going on, even though it was, they were making a big deal of it in the media and hyping it up. They were totally downplaying it at the same time. I mean, ufology was getting assassinated one Pentagon week at a time, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, it turns out, well, I've, I've actually um, now questioned this, but um, according to um, artistic filmmaker Jeremy Corbell, the man with the weaponized curiosity, <laughs> um, according to him, there was only two staff members on the UAPTF. Do you not find that quite interesting when so much information was getting leaked from a department with only two people? <laughs> you know what I mean? So... Th- Something's not right about that, um, mm. you know. Um, why? Why was uh, Jeremy Corbell not questioned by uh, you know, military security intelligence services with regards to the classified information that he published with, on the CIC of an act of U.S. warship? You know, so these things have, come ahead. Excuse me, Jeremy. Have you ever tried to get in touch with him and ask him that? Corbell, yeah, I did get in touch with him and. Um, uh, a few months ago, but I can't remember what I said to him. I think it was more like an, ang- an angry rant. Really? Um, that I was, I was really, because I was getting really fed up that the fact that he wasn't um, checking and rechecking his sources before he went public with his information because hmm. he consistently came out with nothing, and everything that was came out was it was a big deal about nothing, and and it all led to. I mean, every every report you got, it was on the UAP, TF, this was leaked, and it was a Batman bone, and then we got the, the night vision footage of a commercial aircraft, and then we got the other dodgy footage at the end of the supposed UAP submarine, hmm. or the stuff going into the water. I remember what about the aircraft, one. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, um, I, I find everything that he brings out questionable um, ever since... Um, he said that he wanted to get to the truth about the Bob Lazar story, and then he produced the the, the movie used screen prop photograph of the hand scanner, which was used in Close Encounters. And Bob Lazar said, "Oh, yeah, that's the one I used." Now, the whole point of that um, documentary was to try and clear Lazar's name and try and set the record straight, but by producing a uh, a prop of a hand scanner that was used in the greatest UFO movie of all time. It only casts further doubt on what was our saying and the authenticity of his claims. You know, so I, I find the, the the whole. I think Corbell was used this year by the Pentagon. Um, just decided they were just going to you know throw stuff at him, knowing that he would publish it, and it was all garbage. Hmm. Not misinformation um, type of thing. Yeah, it was all misinformation. It was all disinformation. I mean, I've, I was looking at um, Mick West. Uh, have you heard of him? The guy that done a lot of debunking a lot of this uh, military footage. I was watching some of his stuff today, and uh, the guy's quite astute. You know, he knows his stuff. But he was also talking about the, uh, the USS uh, Nimitz encounters, and he was quite able to, to uh, you know, able to explain away quite a lot of the material uh, that was published through that report. So I'm still on the fence with regards to the Nimitz encounter. 
Um, I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about Tic Tac. I mean, we're talking about a, a shoebox flying about here. I mean, what, what, what are we talking here? Do you know what I mean? If we get uh, what, an army of ant, um, um, an invasion of ant men coming to this planet to take over, you know? <laughs> so, uh, now spaceships need to be a bit bigger than, than a shoebox, <laughs> you know? Hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like you, you bring out a good point there, James. I mean, aliens don't have to be sort of like our size, do they? They could be massively bigger than us or little tiny oh, insects. Would, yeah, yeah, they could be nine foot. Yeah, exactly. Uh, none of this three foot uh, small alien graves, you know. Um, no, they're about eight or nine foot, and uh, they're very, they're very imposing looking. I mean, James, um, uh, Michael might be able to fill us in there, Michael, because you've had uh, encounters with uh, aliens. Uh, what is your description of them? Well, of course, it depends upon what race they are. Uh, the the encounter that I had, he was certainly you know about six foot three. The skin was so tightly taut over his his face that you could see all the contours of the bones and the cheekbones sticking out. His eyes were completely black. Uh, his energy was horrendous. Something you know I'd never never experienced before in, in, in what it made me feel like inside. Mm. And, you know, quite clearly it was not not of this world. And, you know, so a lot of the other encounters have been, well, should we say things coming out of portals, uh, massive cigar-shaped UFOs, three of them in the sky, being telepathically invited to certain locations, just like the movie. Yes. <clears throat> and... You know, so James, he's not laughing at you again. There, I'm, 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 I'm not laughing at you. I'm like that happened to me. Yeah, um, like, I, I know James's descriptions to me of uh, the similar similar types of things, Michael. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, I think uh, you know a, a big mistake that the UFO community are making, uh, and why a lot of them are not seeing anything is because they're looking in the wrong place. When you <laughs> when when you look at you know, people looking in, in outer space. It's not in outer space, it's in inner space. Yeah. And that inner space is in, within your scanning sort of a reality. And they operate within different frequencies. Now, when we evolve in terms of vibration and frequency and intelligence and consciousness and spiritual maturity, that's when we'll be able to see them and interact more. But they're not in outer space. They're not in inner space all around us just in, in, in places that we can't interact with because it, it's more vibrationally evolved than we are. So that's why a lot of the UFO community are not seeing things because of, firstly, they're looking in the wrong place, and secondly, they're really selling themselves short in terms of what the UFO phenomenon is. You know, it's more than just a tin box in the sky. It goes yeah. very, 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 very deep, and, you know, there's multiple reasons for, for that depth and, and why there's visitations and why certain people are being chosen to be visited. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very, very deep, deep and long sort of phenomena. But really, it's not that great a phenomenon. It, it's, it's what's normal. We, 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 yeah. we categorise and put labels on it and say it's ufology, it's paranormal, it's supernatural. It, it's not. It's, it's normal. Uh, what is not normal is the fact that we've distanced ourselves and disconnected ourselves from what is normal. And once we once we start to realise that and start to raise ourselves, which is what the monuments and the monoliths and, and really the scripture is really telling us at its deepest levels, once we spiritually mature enough and make ourselves, should we say, more of a higher vibration, then these things will become more and more present around us. There you go. James, that could be what, you, what you've experienced. I, I mean, I, well, I did yeah, suggest to you that maybe you were getting downloads and things, and uh, maybe in a, in a in a broad sense, maybe you've been chosen to get this information out of there as, as well as Michael has. Uh, recognition, that's a one word. Recognition, yeah. Um, yeah, Michael, I find that I find that interesting what you said there about like having to go to a certain place or whatever. Um, my Initial encounter uh, upon seeing this UFO flashing away. I mean, um, I read a report the other night and it said it was flashing lights like ambulance lights. I thought that was quite a way, a, a good way of putting it. Uh, but yeah, it was flashing very bright, ambulance like, like. 
Uh, red, green, and blue lights. I mean, super, super rapid and super bright. And um, it was only this year that I, I, I applied what, what I called deep thought to that particular event. And um, the more I thought about it, you know, the more layers I sort of peeled through. And I, I, I ended up looking up the, the human light spectrum. And because I, I thought, well, if it's flashing all these lights, they usually mean something, you know. So I thought maybe it, it was talking. And uh, when I went and looked at the, the light spectrum, I realised that uh, red was uh, for broadcasting and receiving. So, uh, and obviously the, the green and the blue were for uh, ultraviolet and um, infrared light. So, upon when I first seen this UFO, and I've seen the lights flashing, I've seen it sitting stationary. I've obviously couldn't hear anything. It wasn't a plane, it wasn't a helicopter, it wasn't going anywhere. It's just sitting there flashing all these lights. So within, you know, a second, a fraction of a second, I knew that I was looking at a true bona fide UFO. And upon that, I consciously spoke to it. And I said, come closer. And immediately it shot up at 45 degrees and stopped dead. And then it shot back down momentarily afterwards in the opposite direction at 45 degrees and it stopped dead. And then it shot back to its original position and stopped dead. So it just made a a triangle in the sky, leaving a light trail behind it each time it moved. Once it made this triangle in the sky, it then repeated that five or six times and it hit each three points that it, it had passed previously. But it made hoops of light in the sky with this plasma trail behind it. And uh, again, obviously this year, this the very same night that I was looking up the, the human light, the, the light spectrum, I was also listening to a lecture by the Atomic Energy P- P- Commission for the UK. And I can't remember the professor's name, but it was a, a, a lecture on plasma, uh, plasma physics. So he's talking away while I'm looking up the, the light spectrum and then I start to hear him talking about ion trails and uh, so I switched back and went over to YouTube and started watching what he was saying and straight away he starts putting up diagrams of uh, the the flow that negative and positive ion trails take in a plasma trail and upon seeing this diagram I knew exactly what it was it was exactly what I seen in the sky when this UFO was performing these clockwise hoops. Um, and it, it looked like a positive and negative ion trail that was overlapping each other. It was like spaghetti all rolled up in the sky. And then it shot off and it was gone. Um, so with regards to me speaking to it, that was that. The, the, the event was over. I said goodnight to my friend. Um, I made my way back towards the house. And 15 minutes later, when I get into my street, there was one pretty much sitting at the end of the street. Um, so that event, the second event, um, it was basically flashing lots of different coloured lights again. And then uh, it, it grew brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And then the thing seemed to just completely implode. And that, that was amazing, you know, so... That was it. So my sightings as well was at 4.45 and then 5 o'clock. So that was my first, my first sighting was 4.45 a.m. Um, a week later, exactly at 4.45 a.m., I had my next encounter. Uh, not my next encounter. I had my, my next encounter actually at 16.45 uh, the, the pre- previous night, which was obviously six hours, uh, six days and 12 hours from my first sighting. And obviously, I made a note at the time. I thought, oh, that's interesting. 4.45, you know, for us. That's quite interesting. Thought no more of it. But then on the 11th of December at 4.45 a.m., my friend and I were going to leave to go and get tickets for the Travis gig that was taking place in Glasgow that the following day. And um, my friend said to me at half four, come on, we'll, we'll go, because we were going to meet up with my sister and a uh, friend. And she says, right, come on, we'll go. And I says, no, we'll wait till quarter to five. And she went, why? And I went, I said, because that's when the weird stuff happens. 
thinking, you know, no more of it. I just had an inclination, something would happen. But we left at quarter to five and opened the front door and there was literally a UFO um, two streets away coming towards us, but not towards us, running parallel with us. And uh, we ran into the lane to try and see this thing without the glided streetlights. So that's why we went into the lane. And um, again, up until this year, um, up until June this year, I was of the opinion that we observed one craft come along and then stop dead, and then a second craft materialised right beside it momentarily, and then the two of them started to exchange white patterns. Ah, but this year, um, as I say, I had revelations this June, and I had two flashbacks to my encounters, which shed more light on exactly what happened that uh, that month or that year. Uh, and I realised that my 445 connection wasn't baloney, it wasn't just a weird coincidental uh, wee sideline to it all. There was this 445 had meaning to it. And I knew that for the whole 11 years or 20 years that I've been working into all this. Um, no, 20 years now. But um, for all the years that I've been researching this, I always knew there was a connection with 445 and always, always annoyed me the fact that it was like what is it what is it but again this year as i say i realized that the 445 connection um that there must have been something subliminally subliminally told to me um to be uh at that, that point in time i think on the 11th of december um and i think now on the 11th i was abducted um and i've got like a good reason for saying that, um, it's because of uh, my second flashback, um, I caught more of what was going on. Um, but I've been drawing, I used to doodle these wee aliens and work and all that, I used to draw them all the time. They'd be like, like mushroom heads and uh, big round eyes instead of these oval eyes that everybody draws. I was drawing big, heavy round eyes on these wee mushroom headed guys. And then uh, this year I found out that I'd been drawing them accurately for this time, and I'm like, ah, right, well, there's got to be something to that. But, um, yeah, so I'm now convinced that um, I was taken on the 11th of December, um, maybe even on the 4th of December as well. I'm not too sure, but I know that I definitely had more involvement than I was aware of uh, for all these last 20 years that I've been researching this. And this year, as I say, a lot of stuff came uh, to light a lot of, and I'll tell you this as well um, when I had the first flashback I actually felt a physical sensation on the back left hand side of my brain it was almost like uh, the best way to put it is like have like shiver gel or jelly or something that was like coat, coating a part of my brain just sort of suddenly fell off and slid down the side of my neck and I could actually feel this physical sensation of this thing moving from the back of my head right down the side of my neck, and it was weird. But um, but after that, um, I think that was the 10th, I think that was the 10th of June, and within three days I had uh, solved uh, all sorts of um, UFO-related cases. Uh, within the space of three days, I solved three cases, I solved the STS-103 UFO riddle, uh, I solved my own case and I solved the Illinois encounters that took place on the 5th of January 2000, all in the space of three days. So um, that was quite unexpected. Um, so do you feel they so were all connected though, James? They were, but I just never bridged the connection until this year, because um, for all the years that I was researching my original book, um, Corroborating Evidence, I had been personally looking into reports of um, UFOs that were blue-white oval-shaped or white sort of phosphorant uh, UFOs. You know, I was looking for these bluish white type oval-shaped things. But this year it became apparent that the whole time that I had been staring at these UFOs that I thought were <laughs> oval-shaped, blue-white, UFOs were nothing of the sort. They were actually the spotlight, which was attached to a much, much larger object. 
that was sitting behind that, but I could not see it for the glare of the spotlight. All you see is a an oval <laughs> light in the sky. Um, so yeah, so this year, as I say, um, I concluded that the the sighting that I had on the 11th of December when we went out the front door was actually the one craft that we seen coming along. I mean, before we seen the second craft up here, what we were actually seeing was these. You know, these triangular UFOs, they've got the three white lights underneath. Mm. We were actually seeing two of these lights from underneath as this UFO banked and turned to face us. And that's how this second UFO appeared and then disappeared. It materialised out of nowhere and then it dematerialised. So all that was was this thing was turning around. <laughs> and we briefly got to see part of the underside of it. But um, we stood watching that thing for maybe four, five, six minutes. Um, God knows how long. Well, it was giving it. You know, it was like uh, it was like a fruit machine. You know, with the jackpot. It was just lights were going off everywhere. And then uh, it was my friend that actually realised that there was a, a third UFO, which had appeared higher up towards us, or higher up and closer to us. And it was this other object that um, went out about five bars of light. And uh, it was like a strobe light. But um, when this light came down round about us, um, I could actually see our shadows on the fence when this thing lit us up. Um, but this year, again, as I say, I had the second flashback to that encounter. And um, I remember when I was watching this light when it went off. Now, um Previously, um, Gary Woods, um, who was involved in the A70 abduction in 1992, he described driving through a wall of light, which looked like a detuned television set. So when I read that account, I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's, that's what I've seen kind of thing. Um, my friend also described it as glitter, um, which is another good description. But as I say, when I was trying to focus on I, I said it looked like light, which was bouncing about in every direction at the same time. But um, I, when I had the second flashback, I remember actually trying to stare at the, this light and trying to focus on it. And it was when I was focusing on this light that was bouncing about, I actually seen some something coming through it. And it was like one of those sort of feed uh, curtains that you get. You know, it was like the way it sort of, and it was, it dipped its head as it came through. And this thing was really tall, really tall. And uh, that's the very moment. As soon as I've seen this, I've turned my head and that's when I've seen our shadows in the fence. But that's the only recollection I've got of that. So I don't know if that's a false memory or, but as I say, the, the, the whole fact that I was drawing them for years accurately tells me now that there's, there was more to it, you know. Um, so I find it all very interesting, you know. As, as I say, I've, I've I've learned a few things this year um, that there was more involvement than I, I was aware of. So I am kind of open open to it all now, you know. So it's changed me, definitely changed me. Yeah. I mean, what do you think about it, Michael? Is that is that something to do with what you were you were talking about about everything being inside um, of you? It's not actually extraterrestrial as such, although I do believe there are extraterrestrials, obviously, but. Um... There's something else going on. Now, of course, I mean, when I say it's all inside, I mean, it, when when you look at r- really, you know, our our version of what reality is is our mind, which is in a room that looks out of two windows, which are your eyes. So, a lot of the things that we are seeing and we are experiencing are within our own universe within our own consciousness within our, within our in our own reality and yes of course there are those who travel the stars but what is distance you know when when i look at a what i believe to be a distant star that's really a, an image on the surface of my retina when i look at a star and that starlight emanates then i'm connected to that starlight so what really is distance mm. what is time what is distance what do we understand the universe really to be now when you look at all the ancient philosophies and and everything else they tell you about becoming the god man becoming the union with the god within 
and that really is is your higher level of vibration, your divine mind, your divinity. Now, when you raise yourself sufficiently to to the levels that these beings, these extraterrestrials, these interdimensional travellers are operating on, then you will see them. The amount of things that I've experienced with myself and my wife and a couple of friends on occasions that it's in the middle of the street, in the middle of the day, in the, on a Saturday afternoon in a busy town, and only a few of us seemingly can see them. Hmm. You know, when, when I look up it on, on a Saturday afternoon, bright blue skies, and it's yeah. literally yeah. Saturday afternoon, and there's my wife and I in a car, and we look up, and there's three gigantic cigar-shaped UFOs above our hometown. You know, you would expect the scene to be people, you know, like Independence Day, people dumping their cars and looking up in the sky and and, yeah. and, and that taking all the focus, but it was nothing of the kind. So it has to be a frequency thing. It has to be you sometimes catch a glimpse of the frequency in which they operate within. And when you do that, you can't help but see them. And, you know, when, when you start looking at some of the experiences and and, and when you listen to other people's experiences, it's, it's really remarkable and it's not a coincidence how all of these experiences seem to follow a similar path, a similar line. Now, for, for me, when I first started, I was purely an experiencer. Literally every day I was experiencing something. I was later told that, you know, you, you wonder how you get the information you do. Well, we channel it to you, you know, and, and since birth, you've been chosen for this path. So it's remarkable how many people have the same kind of thing. So I started off as purely an experiencer, and then I was sort of drip-fed exactly what I'd experienced and exactly what it was that was happening to me, which had turned my life upside down. And later on, I, I began to get given, and still do, quite complex quantum mechanic equations. I have been in, in my room literally in the day and, and looked up, and there's been a see-through sphere and there's been some kind of advanced technology within that sphere that I've been allowed to see and it's really a privilege to, to be privy to, to this kind of events that are going around us all the time and you know it's really really nice to be able to see them and interact with them and you know looking in looking in your bathroom mirror which started off as your reflection and then all of a sudden there's a Palladian female looking back at you. That Palladian female then leaves the mirror and she's standing next to you. And then you realise that mirrors are actually portals or they can be used as portals. And there is so much going around that if we're not tuned into that particular frequency, it'll go all around us unnoticed. If we yeah, match yeah. that frequency, then we will see it and we will interact with it. And that is really when, when, the, when they operate in, in, a, in an advanced evolved frequency and a, sort of an evolved vibration that we're not yet existing within, then these things are unnoticeable to us until we tune into that frequency. And the more and more we evolve ourselves, the more and more we will be able to interact with these intergalactic travellers. But when we're looking in outer space for them, there's no need to look in outer space. They are in inner space, which is within our own reality, within our own consciousness remit. If we evolve ourselves in a frequency way, then we can interact with them. There you go, James. Yeah. Can you relate to that? Uh, well, I think that, uh, yeah, um, just what you're saying there, I mean, going back to the, that encounter we had on the 11th, where I say I think we were taken, you know, after that, we went down to Queen's Park, a place called Queen's Park Rex, um, it's just lots of football grounds, but there's a real big, great panoramic view of the sky for there. And uh, we went down there and we watched further UFO activity that night, but or that morning, I should say. But um, we actually stopped two people that we seen walk along the pathway a few hundred yards west, you know, and we shouted them. And it, I think it was a, at first it was a postman, and then it was a woman. And the first guy, the postman, obviously had his gear on and all that, you could tell he was going to work. But we shouted, oh, excuse me, can you see that? And, Aye. Now, you know, he's off ski, he's too busy going to work, and then we see a woman, you know, what? Like, yeah, excuse me, excuse me, can you see that? I mean, me and my pal are standing in the middle of a field, jumping about, ah, <laughs> when he's, you know, I mean, at uh, quarter, to, quarter to seven in the morning, I think it was, before we left there. But, um, 
Yeah, it was just like, as I say, we stopped two people and we're like, can you see that? And they turned around and looked and they went, yeah. And then I've just caught, totally ignored it and carried on with our, our daily lives. Do you know what I mean? It was like, whoa, that's, that's quite interesting, you know, because me, me and my pal stood and we like, pretty much watched a light show put on for us, you know. We, we watched all sorts of stuff happen, um, which involved one of these UFOs coming right down behind a tower block. And it, it went, it actually dipped below the height of the timber block so we could no longer see it. And there was a big light trail that followed this craft as it went down behind the building. The craft disappeared and then the light trail just disappeared. And then as soon as that light trail disappeared, the craft came back up again and the light trail was coming from underneath it. And it moved off and within about five minutes, um, three RAF tornadoes came flying over. And that was it, the show was over. So... That was that was interesting. So that was the first encounter that I had with military jets. And then four days later, I had a second uh, sighting event which involved military jets vectoring in on UFOs for the second, the second time in the same area within four days. So when I made an official report, um, they told me there was no corroborating evidence. And uh, I just knew that was absolute, you know, rubbish. Um and uh, I was, I'm sort of, I'm going to prove, I'm going to prove them wrong one day, you know. <laughs> so uh, I think that was the whole, the whole point. Uh, you know, I, I, is it, when I had dinner with uh, Stanton Friedman down in Homeforth in 2015, um, we sat and I was discussing the reasons why I got into ufology. And obviously, I had these sightings, and I felt felt they were very important. And the fact that I had been given this report, uh, this letter from the Ministry of Defence my name and address on it, my, my name on it, telling me that there was n- nothing going on. I knew that was a personal lie sent to me, and I thought, well, they've lied to the wrong person here. I'm going to, I'm going to set about it and disprove them one day. <laughs> so that was a whole driving force behind corroborating evidence, was to disprove the Ministry of Defence uh, and provide corroborating evidence. So one thing they said that they, they could not find uh, any evidence of. So that was that was a whole driving force behind the first book, um, which cumulated with um, oh, uh, basically what you're saying again, Michael, about going out, going looking around, looking for aliens. I spent pretty much a decade uh, going around the world. Well, not going around the world physically, but looking at UFO reports that were submitted all around the world um, during December 1999. Um, because I realised that I wasn't getting anywhere with my official inquiries. So I decided to start looking for other people's eyewitness accounts, and I wanted to see if I could find other key descriptions that were the key words that I used in my own personal written account, which was published in 2001. So I used my, my written account, the 11th hour I called it, and I used that as a Rosetta Stone, if you like, and then to there, I went looking for um, other other accounts that fitted that, and uh, I collected, you know, quite I amassed quite a collection over over a period of ten years. But it's one of the ones, you know, if you're looking for evidence of aliens, um, you know, there's no, no point in running about the world. It's the best place to find them up in space, you know. Um, and I ended up coming across. Some research regarding, well, I ended up doing my own research, I should say, um, on the NASA STS-103 mission, which was um, between the 19th and the 27th of December, uh, 1999, and uh, it was during, uh, they were going up to repair the Hubble, and in 2010, I I found out about this uh, blue-white oval-shaped UFO, funny enough, um, which appeared on NASA mission frame. I'll just read it after now for the, uh, the listeners. It's, if you want to Google STS 103-734-58, sorry, 59, I beg your pardon, 59, and you'll get this blue-white oval-shaped UFO in the background of a Hubble image. So I learned about that in 2010, and then... Uh, 2012, I actually went back and started to do some research on that particular mission. 
um, which led to some interesting discoveries in 2012 um, when I I discovered the, the shadow of the Hubble Space Telescope on the hull of an unknown physical structured object which appeared in this NASA image. And I knew exactly, I mean, it was, uh, I can remember the day and everything, it was August the 31st, 2012. I knew exactly what I found um, when I realised that I had actually got the shadow of the Hubble telescope cast onto the hull of a UFO. It told me everything I need to know. It told me it was a physical object in orbit with uh, the discovery and the orbiter. So um, I published this information in 2014. And then went on to promote it. As I say, 2015, I went down to Home Park in Stan, Stan Friedman. Um, and I've kind of been shied away for you for the last few years. Um, I've, I've just not been really part of the, the community anymore, as per se. But I've still been back and forth with my own private investigations. But um, this year, as I say, um, this year a lot happened. Um, Revelations this June. Uh, I'll start for June the 10th and snowballed from there. I've put my heart in my mouth every day for six months and I've been literally busting at the seams to uh, impart this information. Um, but I'd also like to say I also tried to publish, I published this information in June or the beginning of July, I believe. Um, and it was quickly removed by Facebook. Um, they removed seven posts that I made on several UFO groups. And despite my attempts to try and get in touch with uh, several branches of the media, um, I was downplayed every time. The Sun newspaper told me that uh, the story of uh, discovering aliens was something that they wouldn't be interested in publishing. They told me that twice. So, no, no, aliens. Oh, have you discovered aliens? Oh, no. Nah. Not interested. Right, fair enough. So um, after a few letdowns earlier this year, I decided that um, I had to do a much more thorough uh, approach to uh, releasing this information because it's not something that you can just put out there uh, and for everybody to, to see and uh, understand in full. So I've had to do a complete... Uh, it was actually through conversation I had with the uh, Black Vault director, John Greenwald. Um, I was talking to him and it became apparent in conversation with him um, that I would have to do a lot more work uh, in order to publish this information. Uh, and that way, uh, the whole community would maybe jumping down my throat um, and jumping to conclusions. So I the, the best way I put it is uh, I had to leave a breadcrumb trail for the reader to fully understand all the circumstances and the evidence and, uh, you know, everything that led me to make the discoveries that I have this year. And um, I'm terrified. <laughs> I'm absolutely terrified. Because um, I can't say too much just now. I don't want to let it all out. I'm, I'm in the middle of doing a couple of articles for... Um, OLM magazine, Out of Limits magazine, and Phenomena magazine will be featuring in December, and I'm hoping to have the, the information out then. But um, it's going to absolutely tilt the world on its axis. It's never going to be the same again. And um, 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 Edward Snowden is just going to look what kids play um, compared to what I've got now. So what I've got could be, you know, it's wonderfully terrifying. Uh, that's the best way for me to put it. It's wonderfully terrifying news, but I would rather put it out uh, and 7.9 billion people would no longer be lied to, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that's that's the morality of my, my stance with this, is I would rather publish and no let anybody get lied to any longer, rather than go insane, <laughs> uh, keeping this knowledge to myself. Um and only a few people know about this. David, you're one of the few privileged people that know. I am, and I, uh, and I do Hal feel privileged, thank you. Excuse me. Robert. It's, it's, no, 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 you're a star, mate. you're welcome. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Malcolm Robson, Ron Halliday, Kathleen Marden, I just want to say, uh, David Marler, I want to say a big thanks to everybody just now mm -hmm. on 
I'm here just to say thanks for your discretion and keeping tight lipped about this little project that I've been working on. Um, and I'm really looking forward to putting it out. But as I say, I've done it. I've tried to do some promoting on this, and um, all I'm being, all I'm doing is coming under attack at the moment. So it's really making me shy away from the community again. Um, because I've got some very bold claims, and obviously bold claims you have to you put your money where your mouth yeah. is. Well, but, I think um, Michael's been there anyway, haven't you, Michael? I think anybody who's in this arena that you know you are intent on revealing the you know revealing truth to people and, and removing the lies, which you know really really pe- people believe that the Antichrist is one thing, the Antichrist is not. The, the Antichrist is anything that is false, anything that is a cause of error, anything that is ill advice, that's politics, that's religion, that's the UFO community, that's the science community, anything that steers people away from the truth yeah. is the Antichrist. And anybody that that has come into this kind of arena where you have controversial, should we say controversial information that really does go against the mainstream narrative. Once you go against the mainstream narrative, then you really will come under attack. And, you know, when when the RAF scramble fighter jets, it's because they pick something up in their skies. And they don't scramble fighter jets for no reason. So when, when you, you know, you see something and then all of a sudden fighter jets appear, it's because they pick something up. That is evidence. I've had the same kind of thing where I've seen balls of fire, what, what appeared to be a ball of fire in the sky. And... I saw it. A couple of my colleagues saw it. I was with an incident with paramedics, and they saw it. And I thought you saw it first thing. Did it make your eyes water? It's. I, I guess it didn't make my eyes water, but bear in mind that in a previous career I was on night duty, and because we were so close to, to Birmingham International Airport, my, my initial thought that it was an aeroplane on fire. That is, that is how sort of bright mm-hmm. and how big. This, this ball of fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he came over, we all witnessed it, completely silent, took photographs of it, which bore no resemblance to what the eyes saw. But nevertheless, he came over twice in the, in the same area of sky, in the same way. Now, three weeks later, my uh, police force helicopter was at an incident in the same area. And when it was on its way back to Birmingham Airport to land, it was followed by a ball of fire. And it was refused permission to land until this ball of fire had left. Now, of course, all the incident logs were, were, were blocked. Everything, you know, nobody could see anything. No one could find anything. Uh, the, 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 there's incidents that I've seen when I was, you know, a serving officer. And uh, they're quite interesting to see who, who the authorities and the establishment, are, what they're witnessing. And I've come back to, to report incidents that I've witnessed whilst on duty. And... As I was doing that, my emails were removed and probably a minute or two later, they were put back as if they'd been taken, copied and then returned uh, with the intent of me not noticing. I've had my phones tapped. We've had anomalies outside in in telephone boxes outside that feed my house and I've had engineers come out and actually find these anomalies that shouldn't be there. So the, the, the powers that be will stop at nothing to try and censor people who are in this arena who are trying to expose the truth uh, because you are a danger to them because they don't want people to know the truth now that it doesn't matter if that's exposing religion if it's exposing the sacred monuments if it's exposing ufology if it's exposing the paranormal anything that they are sensitive about they will try and block you as much as they possibly can and you will be under attack and you will be censored and they will you know, to, to turn around and say that you found evidence of alien life, but we're not interested. Well, why, why, why are you not interested? Because that in itself, you know, to tell... Yeah, it, that's t- a story in itself, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, um, I mean, that's, that's an anomaly. my argument to them was, is, you know, it might be a, a story they might not be interested in publishing, but it's a story that the world wants to hear, you know. Um, but, yeah. Michael, I've had all sorts of problems this year, I'd, I'd, I got in touch with WikiLeaks and they were like, yeah, send us the stuff. You need to download Tor and do it through a secure server. Right, no problem. Boom, boom, boom. It would not, uh, I could not upload it to Tor. It would, I mean, I had everything fine. It's, it just would not 
let me submit my material to WikiLeaks. I got back in touch with them and I'm like, guys, I'm having problems, you know what I mean? Can you help me here? And they've totally blanked me since. Yeah. Um, and then when I get nowhere with WikiLeaks, I thought, right, well, I'll get in touch with Jennifer Robinson. She's a lawyer. <laughs> got her email and her office email and I sent Emma an email. Uh, can you please help? You know, I'm having a problem. Try to get this on to WikiLeaks. Boom, both my, my emails get blocked. So I'm like, Jennifer Robinson, uh, you know, human rights activist. She's not interested in 7.9 billion people being lied to. So I'm super, super ultra disappointed with WikiLeaks as an organ, as a whistleblowing organization who have just totally, you know, turned their, turned their, their cheek on this one. Um, again, I'm not sure what's happening with the Guardian. Um, but the Guardian, we, we done a bit of dancing to and fro earlier on this year. And they were apparently sitting on my material, but then they said it was sent to the wrong department, could I resend it, and so on and so forth. But um, they've, they've not exactly jumped, I mean, it's not as if I was uh, Edward Snowden, they've had to jump the point to, you know, uh, Hong Kong or whatever to go, but, but they weren't in, uh, exactly in a hurry to email me back either. So um, I've been really disappointed with the media, per se, uh, and that's a whole chapter that I bring in in my new book. Uh, does journalism exist? Um, I pose the question because uh, I don't really think it's it's there. <laughs> I can't find it. <laughs> yeah. what, what, what you have to realise is is the many thousands of, of media outlets that are across the world. They are actually owned by six people. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Re- regardless of whether it's WikiLeaks, Wikipedia, you know, Wiki, Wiki, whatever it is, yeah. it's all it's all controlled really yeah. by the same group of people and the establishment whether it's human rights lawyers civil rights lawyers whatever they are they are part of the establishment and they will not rock their own gravy belt you know I, I've, I've written to my MP and had emails blocked you know I, I've I've written to to many departments and had things blocked and then had no reply or you know we're not interested in this why are you not interested in this? Because, you know, even contacting the Colorado Museum and saying, I will come there at my own expense, at my own time, and I will actually yeah. teach you about Egypt, the, the true Egypt, you know, and, and to, for, for them to turn around and say, no, nah, we're not interested, we're mainstream, <laughs> quote, unquote. You know, mm-hmm. there, is, there is a complete attempt to stop any elements of truth coming out. So I'm not surprised... Of course, yes, it can be disappointing, but I'm, I'm not at all surprised because it, it's happened to me, it will happen to you, it will happen to anybody else who follows in these mm-hmm. footsteps because everything wants to give out one world view, just a one view, just a one version of events, which is I this. Don't, don't go changing the canvas. Yeah. yeah. Totally. I mean, I've had three policemen tell me in my face, I've ran this information past three poor police that I've came, and came across, uh, spoke to them, and I'm just while here. Can I worry you? <laughs> Can I worry you for a second, you know? Uh, and then I've briefly explained uh, what I've been doing and what I did and how I found it. And I've been told that what I'm doing is perfectly fine. It's, it's perfectly legal. I've done nothing wrong. <laughs> I'm like, right, okay, then that's fine. <laughs> as long as it's all right with you guys, you know what I mean? Because I, I was like, ah, well, you guys are only going to come in and kick my door in <laughs> at six in the morning. Yeah, you probably <laughs> realised that Michael I, I used to be a policeman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I wasn't sure when you said you were serving forces, so I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you were armed forces or something. Well, well, well I, I, mean, um, I can say categorically, you know, what, what you're doing, what I'm doing. There is no illegality about any of it. Uh, where, where they are sensitive is the fact that it basically proves them to be liars. It proves them to be deceivers. It, I mean, even, even the police themselves, you know, they... they they are part of the establishment, shall we say, and you will not crack that nut. I'm In- going to, I'm going to crack that nut, mate, and I don't care what happens, man. No, um, I, 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 Michael, I, I, Michael, yeah. I have that. I've, I've already cracked that nut. I'm just, I'm just waiting to drop it. I'm really am, and I'm like, that's how I'm just hurt. Honestly, it's uh, these are exciting times in my life at the moment, but I don't know how much longer it's going to have after I drop this information. Honestly, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, at the end of the day, see my information, you're, you're right what you're saying, they're going to come after me, right? Um, one way or another, I'm going to get totally destroyed because 
I remember Stanton Friedman said it. He says, if they can't attack the data, they, they go for the person. So, and I'm like, right, well, nobody can attack my data because it's watertight. It's watertight. I've done my research. I've tied my laces twice. Do you know what I mean? It's like, no. Um, so we said that trip over them, yeah. Double knotted. Uh, this is it. You know, and I'll, I'll not be tripping up. But um, I'm just waiting to drop it. And it's what you say about the establishment, about the one the one vision paradigm and all this carry on. Um, I'm about to spray paint all over that. And, uh, you know, as I say, I, um, I feel shameless about it. Um, uh, actually, my book comes with a disclaimer and a warning at the start of it. And I don't know how many UFO books actually come with a disclaimer or a warning. But... Um, I make no bones about what I'm putting out there and I say that I'm taking no responsibility for the way in which my information is received and what is what happens afterwards. It's, I'm just there to put the information out. I'm just a messenger. And uh, it's going out and there's just no stopping me. Um, it's, 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 it's going to be really interesting because it's, it's going to be one of those ones where uh, an unstoppable object hits an unmovable object. And that's what's about to happen when I release this book. Do you feel that though, James? So, do you feel that, that that will actually be like that, or do you think it may just be one of, another one of these things that they just ignore? You know, because there have been controversial books that have come out before in all sorts of different subjects, and they they can't just get ignored and brushed aside. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Well, the way I see it is, I mean, when you were talking about your MP there, um, Michael, I, I wrote to my, my local MP who was good enough to respond. Uh, and say, sorry, this is actually your uh, Westminster MP that will need to deal with this. So I got a reply for him, which was really nice, because obviously I sent him all my information. Um, so I have that email going right back to July, or June, July. Um, but my parliamentary MP has just totally ignored me, but they'll still want my vote when it comes to <laughs> time, you know. But, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, was, I, was, I, never held back, I was actually you know? going to use David Icke as, a, as an example. I mean, a lot of the things that he, yeah, where he writes about things is exposing things left, right, and centre, and they just in the in the mainstream get ignored. If you see what I mean, um, it is. you know, <laughs> so nobody really dares to take him on, you know, yeah. take it to court or anything, because they know that if it goes to court, everything comes out. You know, so uh, he's taken races twice as well. Uh, um. You never know, Davey. I might be on tour with him next year. <laughs> <laughs> you might not know, James, but um, Michael's had a little series on Iconic, which is uh, very interesting. Yes, he was. He was filmed. I've, I've done movies with the movie with Eddie Van Gunnick and uh, Eddie Van Gunnick and David Icke and, and different things. You you are right. You know, the, these controversial things come out, and and what, why should we, we we be shamed? You know, why, why should we feel shamed for for revealing the truth? Oh, exactly. To people? Yeah, I agree with you. They, they, they've been lied to for, for, for too long. They, they you and know, that's the way I see it. Yeah, yeah. Um, they have the right to an alternative view, and and if they don't accept that, then that's fine. But at the moment, all they're getting is one narrative, you know, and that and that's not right because that 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 one narrative is clearly false. We all are false. Hmm. We all are false. Um. Oh, I mean, I, suddenly I'm just getting a. Uh, Pictograms thrown into my head there of, uh, I should say, hieroglyphs. Uh, something else I, I found really interesting this year was um, I found several uh, hieroglyphs of, uh, in, uh, oh, I'm trying to think now, the temple is, the Abydos temple, I'm not too sure. But there's uh, depictions of the Ank, but it's uh, Horus, but he's holding two, uh, he's holding the staff. In each arm, and the, the staff head, it's a bird head, but it's not a bird head, it's a pterodactyl. It's a pterodactyl. And I, I, I looked up the birds and everything, there's nothing in Egypt that would resemble what these, these things are, apart from a pterodactyl. And I'm thinking, well, what's going on here with the timeline? Um, when, you know, the Egyptians uh, are meant to be, they're, they're, they're accurately depicting what a pterodactyl head looks like. You know, um, and there's a vast, vast difference in timeline. So I found that interesting. Um, it's maybe something I'll, I'll branch into when I get more time and go into other other aspects of, uh, you know, ancient civilizations and things like that. 
Have you got any suggestions? Uh, Sorry, have you got any thing. suggestions there, Michael? Because I know you you deal a lot in the sort of symbolism and things on the ancient um, sites, especially like Egypt and, and that. Yeah, a- a- ancient Egypt is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years old. It's 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 when you look at the you know the the weak and feeble attempts at Egyptologists to actually date. You know, when, they, when they're telling us the three and a half thousand to five thousand years old is absolute nonsense. The the scepter that you're talking about is, is called the was scepter. Now you'll see a tuning was. fork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll see a tuning fork at the bottom of that. When mm-hmm. you look at certain oracle sites, which is usually usually on top of water, not always, but usually like, for instance, you know, the the altar stone in Stonehenge. When you when you lie on that, it's almost the crypt. It's the same with cathedrals and churches and, and ancient monuments. There are crypts underneath them. Now, when you get a candidate, an initiate, who lies on this crystalline sort of stone and you hit the stone with the was scepter, it tunes their body and activates their pineal gland. Now, when you start looking at Egypt and um, the ethos of Egypt and what the Great Pyramid stands for and when you look at why Egyptologists are telling us that the the Great Pyramid was a, was a tomb for pharaohs, well, they are correct, but what they're not telling you is, for one, what the pyramid represents – where the tomb is and what the tomb is and what a pharaoh is when you start to learn those three things then you realize that you're only getting half truth so it's really all to do with the godhead it's all to do with the the activation of the god within it's all to do with the transmutation of self and all of these different things were tools in order to do that so the you know the great pyramid is under the hundreds of thousands of years old and the, the, the Egyptian civilization didn't build them. And it was the mathematical creator of the universe that built these monuments with with absolute supreme mathematics that only someone with a supreme mathematical mind could actually put there. And, you know, it takes some doing to actually interpret them. But there's, there's a lot of method in the madness, you know, and there's a lot of symbology through masonry through modern day that came from Egypt. As we mentioned mm-hmm. at the beginning, you know, when you look at the Bible... The original Bible is the Giza Plateau. It's just been corrupted through Hebrew and Christian hands. Mm-hmm. And when you look at all the main stories of the Bible, it's talking about the transmutation of self. It's talking about that secret place within, which is the mind, which is consciousness. When you start looking at the Christ story, it's not a physical man. It's it, it's a metaphor. When you look at the Egyptian gods, you, you see that they are mathematical formulas and they are evoking certain deities into this reality through certain geometric shapes and the shapes they were using were circles and triangles which is the shapes of the the ancient monuments and monoliths of the the ancient world so we we are talking about the transmutation of self we are talking about the inner christ the 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 kingdom of god you know when 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 two eyes become one you enter the kingdom now that one eye is the opened pineal gland and when you look at osiris osiris means open eye you know, when you look at the the obelisk, which is the symbol of the phallus of, the, of Osiris, what does the phallus have? It has one eye. You know, we are talking about deep, deep esoteric information that is encoded within these monuments. Jesus. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I found a lot of things out this year as well with regards to the ancient sites um, that were kind of really eye-opening with regards to like, the Stonehenge. Um how they had actually organised that was actually a mechanism. Um, and then I realised that the Giza Plateau, as they say, it was the same. Uh, there was a, there was, uh, it was a device, it was a mechanism that was getting used for something. Uh, and what you're saying about the Bible, about, you know, um, I, I, I concluded this year that the, the Great Seal, which is in the antechamber in the Great Pyramid just before you go into the King's Chamber, uh, it's the one glyph that um, is in the whole pyramid, and it's 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 known as the boss seal, but basically it's a loaf of bread. And uh, I realised that the, there was a connection there with uh, Jesus. And um, oh, oh, there you go. Oh, oh. Ah, just fell, just cracked my head open. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I really? realised that there was. <laughs> I've probably done me good. Um, I, I, yeah, I realised there was a connection with the Great Pyramid, with uh, the body of Christ. Mm. And I'm just like, well, what's going on here and all this? You know, I found 
a few things out this year that really made me think twice. Uh, and what the, 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 the blood of Christ is. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm quite convinced, um, that we were quite technological, um, when going back thousands of years, we had the electricity and we knew more than we should have done, um, with regards to why these monuments were created and what their purpose was. And, um, I mean, the Great Pyramid cre- uh, created ozone and they knew it was going to create ozone. And, um, so, you know, what was the purpose? What was a big need for them to be create ozone? <laughs> Oh, around the world through these pyramids, you know, and all these mere neolithical sites. Um, they were all creating ozone. So everybody that was uh, generating well being and it was there was a lack of uh, disease and stuff like that. So yeah, they were ancient, ancient, ancient man was super too closed up um for history to be getting told the way it is. And uh I just find that fascinating. It's just like, you know, what is it? Back to that thing we were talking earlier on about reality and all that, that perceived reality and what we're getting thrown at us uh, and what we're getting told, you know, reality really looks like when it's just nothing like that at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so, aye, uh, it's fascinating. Um, and I'm, I'm just, as I say, I'm busting at the seams at the moment. Oh, my energy, my vibrational tones. Oh, to back to that. The earlier this year, uh, actually, I was telling my brother about it um, about during the summer and all that when all this was going on. At one point, I told you about obviously I had uh, felt the sensation of the thing in the back of my neck. I also uh, got this amazing, amazing feeling of well-being that I just never felt in my life. Do you know what I mean? It was just like I, I was just sitting in the living room and I just felt it coming right over me. And I don't know if that was all my chakras aligning or whatever, but. What I know now, and I know now what my, my job is, basically, I think I know why I was involved in all these UFO sightings, and I was given a role to play, maybe, possibly, uh, who knows, but uh, yeah, I'm just happy to, because I used to always believe that I was a scribe in a past life, I used to think I was an Egyptian, and that's, that's where I thought my love of Egypt came from, I was, I was a scribe in a past life, and I got killed for being a bad speller, <laughs> you know, something like that. Um, but no, I'm now I'm kind of more of the belief that I'm actually a scribe in this life, and um, I think that's pretty evident by my second book coming out. So um, I'm hoping to um, rock a few boats with this information, and I'm hoping it does get out and it does get the information it deserves, uh, the, the, the attention it deserves, I should say, and it should do. Um, because I make some comparisons um, with the likes of the Gary McKinnon case in 2001 with regards to him hacking into NASA, getting caught, finding nothing. And then there was a big song and dance about it for a whole 10 years while they were waiting to extradite yeah. him. Um, and the guy found nothing, but everybody wanted, what did you find? Nothing. Tell us all about that. <laughs> you know, so it was like that. And, you know, it was like, oh, and it was all hearsay. Do you know what I mean? I mean, Granted, all right, maybe he's seen stuff, and I do believe that he's seen stuff, but he, he couldn't back it up, you know, and that's what was really disappointing about it, was the fact that he hacked in, and he had nothing to show after getting caught, and you're like, oh, that's a shame. So, and that's what I, I, I feel bad about as well, is the fact that he hacked in, trying to find evidence of ET, got into all that trouble, you know, disrupted his whole life, or his mum's life, yeah. and all sorts, and all he had to do was go into a public NASA server, um, but again, I don't think these photos were only published until 2010, so fair enough, it was 10 years ahead of my time, you know. But um, I just find that tragic, the fact that um, all that happened, and the likes of myself, I went on a public NASA server, and I'm able to take down NASA, SETI, ESA, uh, all in once, and in the Pentagon UFO report, all going to fall with dominoes all going to fall with dominoes and that's what I'm terrified about because I'm just I'm just not ready for what happens next um, but as I say I'm I'm going to I'm going to push that button you're not going to cause World War 3 are you James? well <laughs> the Brookings report back in 1960 said that if any evidence of an alien civilization was ever presented to the public it could cause the downfall of society yeah 
Yeah. You know, it is a possibility. So um, I, that's why I put a disclaimer at the start of the book. Like, ah, look, if this happens, it's in my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really think... That's basically it. You know, I'm like, ah, look, my bad. Sorry about that, you know? Yeah. Oh, God. So uh, I'll know about it when there's anarchy in the streets, do you know what I mean? Yeah, just... I've got all sorts of just keep your address. Christians. Just keep your address secret, that's all you... Aye, <laughs> well, I could always just give it to Gary Laro, okay? <laughs> Gary has all time, and I'm oh. sure, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it might make its way about. <laughs> Is that name again? <laughs> are, we, are, we allowed, are we allowed to say that on air? Well, you Gary. said it already now, so it wasn't me that said it. I've so. said it already, man. That's I do, I do make a, yeah. I do make a disclaimer at the beginning of this show that so uh, whatever the whatever the guest says, it's, <laughs> I bet I'm it's, one it's, it's, one it's not me yeah. saying it, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know but it was, it was the voices it was the voices <laughs> <laughs> the voices made me say it <laughs> but yeah it's quite interesting that isn't it how uh, how only one person in the whole UFO community can have your name and address and then suddenly it's public knowledge all of a sudden yeah well there was a few people who uh, ex- experienced that so <laughs> uh, what was it four, four people who has been in style yeah yeah. Something like that. yeah absolutely horrible horrible Anyway, never mind, no time for that. No, but that's, right, you're, so, you're going to be tackling something like that in your book, aren't you, James? Or, you, or is that later for something else? Well, uh, I'm, um, I'm, are, we, are we talking here about the Larry Warren fraud scandal? Um, well, that's up to you. I mean, I'm, I, I didn't bring it up. <laughs> he did, this is it. An NME, uh, The Guardian, the BBC, you know, um, so... Okay, yeah, I do cover the Larry Warren scandal uh, briefly. Uh, I mean, the thing is, it is, I... it is quite public knowledge anyway, so it's not as if you're sort of bringing anything out that's not been said before anyway. So, um... I'm just, I think it's a very important point that I, I'll, I'll let the reader know that I have a very, very bad taste in my mouth after going through that experience of trying to save that man's reputation before he done something he would later regret. Yeah. And we're not talking about, we're and, not talking about um, Larry Warren here, we're talking about Gary Heseltine, aren't we? We're talking about Gary Heseltine's career here, how, uh, yeah, I tried to do him a good turn uh, on August the 26th, 2016, and notified him of uh, my findings with regards to some items that Warren sold at auction, yeah. and... Um, some of his claims that he was making about May Pang giving him presents, and then I got in touch with May Pang. She said nothing, and she just it, it, it was all lies. He was at it, and I notified Gary Hazeltine of this, and went, Gary, you're about to host, host a conference with this guy. You're an ex copper, you know what I mean? You're, you're, and he's at, and he's at it, you know what I mean? What, mm. How can you know? What I mean, your career's going to go down this swanee if people find out that an ex copper, a former detective, eh, cannot see that he's working with a confidence trick stuff. They blocked me and then um, got, and it all spiraled for them. And three weeks later, out the blue, I started getting death threats to Larry Warren, despite telling, telling Gary Heseltine in confidence. Mm. Uh, and then after the death threats, we got a, I got a legal wear, which confirmed that Warren did have my name and address. And of course you were the only one, one. as we have to be said, doesn't it? Uh, there was no, no, no. Yeah, no there were several of us. Uh, well, uh, several, several people who got, got death threats. Yep. <laughs> yep. But I'm, I'm pleased to announce um, that I am now having the matter investigated um, as to how Warren obtained my name and address because I gave his lawyer 30 days notification um, to contact me to tell me if uh, it was a third party or Mr. Warren that supplied them with his address, uh, with that address. And um, they never get back to me. So um, it's now a matter for the Information Complaints Commissioner. Um, so if there was a data protection breach there, the two of them better start worrying. Um, so that's all I'm saying there. Mm. Um, well, shame on the two of them. Um, but I'll be bringing it up in the new book. Um, I'll be going over my, the disgusting way I was treated. And uh, the, the kind of stain it left on ufology for me and how... I couldn't. I couldn't look at ufology in the same way anymore. It was tainted. I know. Was, I know it damaged you a lot, didn't it? Well, it da- I think it damaged. It, really, se- it damaged several of us was, in some ways. But, uh. it, it was really horrible. What I seen that, that Larry Warren is a character, and what he had he, he done to Peter Robbins over the course of the last thirty odd years, repeatedly telling him lies, mm. 
and using Peter to promote him and to promote his, well, ultimately lies and disproved his lies and uh, Cosmo publishers uh, came to that conclusion that, uh, you know, they were uh, committed to printing high quality books and they suspended it because they believed that it didn't meet that category after the information was sent to them. Mm. And that's why they ultimately removed the book because it didn't meet the category of their standards mm. um, on, the, on the fact that it was embellished. So um, that was that. That was all, it. Was all put to bed um, far before Mr. Hazeltine decided to embark on Capel Green with Mr. Warren. Yeah. Uh, this was after I'd notified him about what was going on with Warren. So he made his own bed, and um, he can put on a suit all he wants and go on camera and kid on his some sort of professional because he can rhyme off dates and places. But he's no more of a uh, observer than you and I. He's not got supernatural ability just because he says he has. You know, I'm a trained observer. Right? Yeah. Okay, what do you mean? I, I've got glasses, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I've got better vision than you. I've got eight yeah. I've got, I think we ought to point thing. out what cap- what you meant by Capel Green. Capel Green's a, a film that's been, well, been about four years in the making, I Listen, think, at the moment. It's, uh, it's a, a pointless documentary that the two of them embarked on um, with filmmaker uh, Dion Johnson. In 2000, and I think it was November 2017. It was after Cosimo pulled left the Eastgate. Yeah, just print. straight, almost straight after, but, wasn't um, it? Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure it was late November. Um, the Mr. Hazeltine was like, "Oh, Cable Green, uh, you know, we're going to totally rewrite the Rendlesham mm. Forest incident, and uh, we'll just call it something else and insert Larry Warren into that scene as he's already been debunked yeah. in the case and the." The Rendlesham Forest incidents or the RFI, he's been debunked in that arena, so we'll just call it Cable Green and we'll swap them back. Well, I think we'll originally they were, gonna, they they were saying that they would get um, left at Eastgate reinstated, didn't they? But uh, it... Oh, yeah, they said it would just be a matter of time before it was reinstated. Yep, yep, yep. But, but um, I mean, Warren, uh, that, I remember there was a press article about it and Warren said that um, he still stood by every word of it. But, I mean, at the end of the day, Cable Green says it's not science fiction, but at the end of the day, if uh, bionic deer and premature planetary alignment are, are not science fiction, I don't know what is. Mm. I really don't know what is, you know. <laughs> so good luck to them with that project. Um, good luck with that, guys. Um, so, yeah, the two of them got to be mentioned in my book um, for the disgusting way that myself, you, and other people were treated by Warren and Mr. Hazeltine uh, being called trolls for 18 months wasn't very nice. Uh, I think I call it, it was, David, for me, the way I wrote about it in the book, I said it was like uh, Groundhog Day meets you know, a nightmare in Elm Street every morning, waking him up to social yeah, media yeah. to see what he dropped off. That's right, yeah, yeah that's night. what it was, yeah, I know what you mean. That's what it was for 18 months, it was like, shh, what what are we getting today? Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, um, Larry Warren only disproved himself. Yeah. It was uh, the likes of Sasha, yourself, me, that we're all able to start going, hold on a minute, you know, you're, you're, you, you can't be in two places at once and so on and so forth. And, you know, the sun doesn't rise at quarter, yeah. uh, half past six in the morning in December and suffer. Well, you we, know, we, you're wrong. I think we, have, we, we should point out it was quite an in-depth uh, investigation, really based on Sasha's, uh, Christie's original um, investigations and blogs and everything. And it was enhanced by a couple more people. You know, yourself and myself. We we all started doing some searching and um, found quite oh, quite a few things and anomalies. Eh? You know, we we found quite a few things going on. And um, yeah, because I mean, you know yourself, Sasha was doing her stuff and I was doing mine, and the two of us were doing independent research, but the two of us were coming to the same conclusions. Yeah. And I would find stuff that she would miss, and she would find stuff I would miss, and oh, and then when we combined our research, we were like, this is you know. We built up, well, Sasha herself built up a mountain of evidence, you know. But, I mean, it was just nice to lay a couple of tiles yeah. for her. Well, I mean, Sasha um, had a good start on everybody because she'd known him for 10 years, didn't she, basically? And she, you know, she was built, she, she'd heard all the uh, information firsthand from him and started realising there was something wrong with it. Bring up the, the Carrie Fisher story as well, remember that? Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> like well, it's up to you. If you, if you want to tell that little story, Michael, I hope you're enjoying all this. You probably don't know a little bit of all this. So. <laughs> well, I, I, I've, I've spoken to you, David, when about your investigation into it. I mean, all, all I can add is I became very, very suspicious of uh, Eddie Hasseltine when... When I, when I first came to this, as I said, you know, mm. initially I was, I was purely an experiencer. Now you have Gary Asseltine who, who you know, com, comes on the shirt tells of I'm ex police. I've set up this UFO group for police officers and ex police officers who are seeing UFOs and seeing these things. Now I can say hand on heart, there was no police officer in, in this country that was seen more than me. Either when when I was serving or after I'd resigned, and I thought it was very very suspicious that every time I tried to contact Mr. Hasseltine, uh, he never got back to me. He was never interested, and I thought that was very very suspicious. Mm, strange, considering, isn't it? considering that's exactly what he what stated, yeah. stated that, that, he was, that he was setting these groups up for, and that that to me just didn't ring true. There you go, Graham. That, that, the first hand you've heard that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, my biggest regret is, I, I just wish I'd never looked out for him, but mm. um, after the way I was treated, you know, but if the law was broken and, you know, if uh, my rights were violated, my privacy, my data was uh, shared illegally, then um, they will, the, the, the law will see that and they will prosecute accordingly. But um, if not, the two of them entirely innocent until such times in a court of law, as Gary likes to say. But the thing about him is, is Gary says that he prides himself on bringing, uh, he says the things that he looks for, he was given a, a, um, an interview with some girl um, from Sweden or something, I'm not too sure, but Finland or something, I'm not sure. Uh, nice girl, but um, the way he was talking to her was just, uh, it was horrible. Uh, was, that's what I was focused on, the way he was speaking to her. Was, uh, just the way he treats women in general. But um, he was like, oh, the things I bring to ufology is, I look for is oral. He's like, that's his uh, evident, written evidence or spoken evidence. And he's like, documentation, written evidence. And, and he's like, you know, and physical evidence. And um, so I made a point of making a note of that in the book and going, well, look, I gave him uh, oral evidence, which was for May Pang. <laughs> I gave him documentation, which was the Charlie Lennon letters that Warren wrote. And I also gave him the physical evidence, which was the links to the items that Warren sold, which, which were fake. So I don't know what part of that evidence that um, Gary Heseltine was unable to see. But I'm sure when I bring my book out and the press get wind of what's going on and uh, they'll see that Gary Heseltine isn't he, the cracked up UFO researcher he, he kids onto the world he is. Hmm. Um, it's just a chance of, And um, he sold me out for 30 pieces of silver to eh, Larry Warren in 2016 and I'll never forgive him for that. Hmm. Um so, you know, he'll mend him. That's it. He made his own bed. That's it. That's the way I see it. Is like he made his own bed. Uh, but I'm talking about vibration and all that. I'm no negative at all towards these people. I've got no time for them anymore. I've been through hell and back with them. And now I'm above it. I'm not going to get dragged back into it when I bring this out. Um, but I just want to state for the record my experience and um, show them up for what they are because I don't want them getting away with fraud within the UFO yeah. community because it was heartbreaking to watch the first time round what he done to Peter. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I honestly, Peter's family to me, and Peter had to stay with me for a couple of days during that conference. I, by the time I left, there was pretty, pretty much blood brothers, do you know mm. what I mean? Uh, so I was absolutely livid. I was livid when I found out um, what was going on. And uh, I still am. Uh, it still hits a raw nerve with me. Um, so, yeah, I've just got no time for chancers within the UFO community. I just really don't like seeing the subject uh, getting milked and used as everybody's personal money bank Yeah. Um, to, to make a few bob. I mean, yeah. Um, See, on the other hand, we, so, we are actually looking forward to... The emergence of Capel Green, if it ever comes out, uh, to see what's actually in it, aren't we? I want to see the blooper. Uh, I want to see the blooper roll, you know. Uh, that would be no, that, that probably would be as funny actually, you know. Why not? But, um, I mean, I'll say, I'll say, I won't be buying a copy, but I'm sure we'll see a copy somehow. 
Uh, you know, uh, just for the record, I, I contacted Netflix some time ago and sent them all the stuff uh, that was to do with the Cosmo investigation and all that, and I made them aware that Mr. Warren was also, a, as well as seeing aliens, he was also a, a 9-11 first responder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I made them aware that Larry Warren wasn't just a an alien uh, airman uh, action man, he was also what, a yeti. Like oh, yes, yeah, the most uh, amazing Germany. Bigfoot sighting ever, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, uh, you know, if it's if it's out there, you've seen it. Uh, he loved it. So, uh, I've, I had a, I've had enough of that. Him. So, yeah, it's um, just basically, I just thought, you know what, I, it, it really left a big mark on my life, and I was really affected by it, and it really mm. uh, tainted my, my love for ufology. But I've come back to ufology, but as I say, I'm not, too uh, enamoured with the, the community at the moment. You know, as I say, I've been putting out big claims over the last week or two, and all I'm doing is getting attacked. And I'm just like, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to bother putting out big claims anymore. I thought, you know what I'll do? I'm just going to drop the information and let everybody run a bit like he goes chickens afterwards because uh, there's no point in me trying to promote something if I, if I can't uh, speak. I can't, I can't say what it is because I just can't let the cat out of the bag. But as I say, I'm, I've got a nuclear bomb that I'm about to drop on the Pentagon, <laughs> yeah. and I make no apology. Yeah, I make no apology. Yeah, I mean, I've, I think all we can say to, to sort of close that little bit off, it, there's a, there's an awful lot of um, jealousy in the well, I suppose in any 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 branch of the paranormal, the UFOs, and uh, probably anything. You know, that's that's the way I see it. I mean, people just get jealous of that you've got a better story than they have, or. Your book's better than uh, his. I've seen four I've seen five. Yeah, totally. You know. Um, yeah, there's a lot of pride in the UFO community. And there's a lot of... Uh, I mean, I hate to say it, you know, it's like, but, but there is a lot of uh, people looking down their noses at you. Mm. Um, they're too high to, to communicate with. Um, I mean, I, I've tried to, again, over the last six months, I've tried to take on a few people and go, come into my circle and mm. have a look at this. What's of and I've been annoyed by quite a few people. Um, I just want to point out that it's not usually the writers of books that um, have got the jealousy. It's usually their supporters that come along and start picking sides, don't they? As to who they they think they is, is written a better book than so and so, or they who they they support better than another. That's 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 my experience. I don't really get a lot of um. Um, all the people I've spoken to, like yourself and, and Michael, um, you haven't got sort of any extra grind with other writers or anything about other books. It's usually the people that support no, those books. I've, I've not got an extra grind with anybody, but what I won't tolerate is people putting out false claims and expecting everybody just mm, to keep... Well, there is that, yeah. I was, I was saying to the guy in the shop today, I says, look, I says, mate, it was hard to be a plastic box for all the sweets. And it was empty, you know, and I says, it's, I says, it's like you standing holding that and saying that a lighter would not melt that, and then I come along and melt it, and then you, you're going to bad mood with me. I was like, well, it's your no fault for making stupid claims. <laughs> you know, and it's as yeah. simple as that. Yeah. You know, uh, element 115 can be weaponized. Ooh. It can, it can only last for like 220 milliseconds, so do you want to explain that one to me, Jeremy? Do you know what I mean? You want to put your money where your mouth is? You know, so... Um, things like that, you know. Um, so, and, you know, as I say, I will not. I, I'm, I'm, I'm no one for keeping being shy. Do you know what I mean? And I've, as I say, I've not got an axe to grind with anybody. But I'm not going to stand here and listen to. I, do, I mean, I'm not the UFO police. Do you know what I mean? I'm not to to go around correcting everybody's work. That's false, false, true, mm. false. You know, what I mean, that's that's no me. I'm, all I'm there to do is just go. What this happened to me? This is what I did about it. This is what I found. There it is. And supply the evidence and, for and it. Run, yeah. And run. Yeah. <laughs> and run as fast as I can. Um, but as I say, I've not got an axe to grind with anybody. Warren, it's personal. I would say um, between Warren and Hazeltine, they really, really done me, done me over uh, in 2016. Uh, and calling me a Nazi and Antifa. Oh, yeah. yeah, and all that, yeah. Worse. Yeah. Worse. And I've, I've said, you know, I mentioned in the book that what he said was un, unforgivable. But to be fair, he was in the middle of learning what it, like, what it was like to be caught out by 40 years of lies. Mm. And his co-author severed ties with him. You see his book getting pulled from under his feet. 
he was in full metal meltdown. So, you know what, it's understandable, but it's still unforgivable what he did, and if the law was broken, yeah. then... Um, well, at the time, it wasn't quite movie. 40 years, but it was probably about 30, well, getting oh, over, getting know, over I, 30 I, years, wasn't it? I, yeah. It was coming up by, I, I, it, was, it, was, it was coming up the 40th anniversary, I was coming up, approaching it, that's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know what I mean, um, I, I'm just thinking right back to the event, mm, you know, mm. um, but as I say, yeah, it doesn't matter if it was a year or five years, ten years, whatever it is. Warren um, took advantage of Robbins, and uh, yeah, I feel so bad about it. And um, it just goes to show you that Warren, what he was trying to do uh, to get stardom, he wasn't even involved. I mean, what really, really drove me mental about um, the Capel Green when they keep advertising it, they're saying, oh, we'll be releasing new documents. Hmm. And it's like, yeah, because all the old ones were, um, were, were, were you know, debunked as uh, fabrications. <laughs> so what's the point of producing new documents when all the old ones were fraudulent? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, they, they, they get to be met, but as I say, they get they get a passing mention in the book. Um, but I've left it all for the appendix, uh, along with some of the the, the information, um, so the reader can make up their own mind. Um, as to whether or not I'm a troll or uh, whether or not Gary's telling the full story and being totally transparent yeah. with uh, his subscriber, his audience. Well, you know? he, he, has put his, not... he has put his point of view out on several shows before now without anyone having any, uh, bit able to come back on it. So um, I think it's only fair that you've had your chance to say something. So, As I say, he sold me out for 30 pieces of silver in mm. 2016 and I was trying to save his career. But... Uh, he joined the dark side, and I think that's the chapter, uh, joining the dark side. I think that's what I call it. <laughs> anyway, um, on, on that note, anyway, on, on the uh, Rendlesham Forest uh, incident, uh, for the 41st hmm. anniversary, uh, I thought I'll just make this little announcement. I've got Monroe Neville's, it looks like I'm doing a show with, uh, for the 41st anniversary, which should be quite interesting. Uh, he was the man that went out with Colonel Holt, and um, I think he was taking radiation readings. So that should be quite an interesting show. That's if it all goes to plan. It, it, at the moment, it's all right on board, and it should be fine. So, yeah. So, Michael, yeah, definitely what you're saying about frequency. I definitely think there's something going on in there, really, what you're saying about frequencies, vibration, and uh, what you're giving off. I mean, my sister said it reminds me of it all the time about giving off positive and negative energy. But um, I, 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 do de- I, de- I do definitely think that um, I had communication the very, very first night. I had the, the first sighting when this thing threw itself in the sky before going away. Um, that was really interesting. But um, author Ron Halliday actually he touched on it in his book Haunted Scotland, um, where he said perhaps I had opened up to that sort of frequency and they were responding and again it's going back to what I was saying earlier on about um, seeing people on the pathway that passed us that just weren't sort of on that frequency if you like you know it's um, just totally oblivious to it um, so I find it fascinating you know as, as I say um, I, I met with um, Yari Nicola back in 2012 and uh, Yari used to be a former coding architect for IBM, but he also was a NASA contractor. And uh, we, we had lunch one day in Edinburgh, and um, we had a good discussion over what I found back in 2012. And he was talking about, you know, the very fact that um, UFOs make themselves visible when they have the ability to cloak themselves. He says, you know, you've got to ask yourself, why do they make them visible to some people and things like that, you know? And it's come back to what you were saying earlier on about driving down the motorway and seeing these things and everybody else is just carrying on doing their own thing. Um, so it's very interesting, um, the whole perception thing of it all, you know. Um, but I just know that there's there's good things coming. Now, now this is all part of the plan. And uh, I do believe that uh, I'm playing a role in all of this. Uh and I'm looking forward to just putting it out there and running away, <laughs> as I say. Uh, because, I, as I say, I'm, I've no idea how this information is going to be handled. I'm terrified. 
Has he got any right to be terrified, Michael? I mean, you put things out there and you haven't run away, have you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm hating under that big rock. The thing is, when, when the, the the unknown is always unnerving because, you know, if you've yeah. never been there before, if you've never been beyond the horizon, you know, uh, if you if you do go beyond the horizon, if you do go into to realms and realities beyond ours, then you are the hell of him. That's exactly what it means. If you haven't been past the horizon, you don't know what's there. Of course, it's going to be unnerving. <clears throat> uh, when when you put this information out, you know when you say you have a role to play. Of course you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be seeing these things. You wouldn't be experiencing these things. The the, the very reason that you are says that you have a role to play. Says that you've been chosen to play that role. And when you go in, you know, I believe you were describing in past lives. Well, when you look at the deep initiation beliefs, the, the belief is that you carry on in this life where you left off in the last one. So it is a it is a path where you don't necessarily have to get involved in, in underground rituals. Sometimes your life mirrors the ceremonies, ceremonies of initiation, which, which is what mine does. And, you know, I, I'm related to... Egyptian royalty through, through Irish kings. Now, when you said earlier on, and I totally agree and concur, that there's not only a connection between Egypt and Gobletechi and Stonehenge, but there's a connection between the whole of the ancient world and the stars and the planets and the side down in city on Mars, which mathematically give you the precise location of how to find other monuments on Earth from Mars and so on and so on. There's a gigantic assistance going on on, on, a, on a solar system and galactic scale scale and anybody who's involved in that and exposing that has been chosen to do it so you do have a role to play we all have a role to play the information how i sort of express it and how i, I <clears throat> sort of explain it is these things are going to happen now i feel that I'm an observer on my own ship of life. And I think that that ship of life has been set a course and it's going to reach that course, it's going to reach that destination and I'm, and I'm an observer on the ship. So I'm looking at what has already been determined. I'm looking at this is what you're going to do with your life. This is what you're going to expose. You're going to go there, you're going to have to go there, you're going to have to go on the crest of the wave because that's what's been determined. So I don't think you'll have much of a choice, James, in, in putting this information out because it'll just take you. And that's what I have found. The wave just takes you. And wherever your ship of life goes is where it's meant to go. But you, you yeah. certainly have a role to play or, or you wouldn't be experiencing these things. There you go, James. Hi. Um yeah, I mean, uh, no, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's nice. I mean, there's, but is it just what you're saying about Irish kings there? We do, that old Irish saying, may the wind be at your sails. You know what I mean? May the sun be in your face, and the wind be in your sails. No, of course. So, again, when, when you look at Ireland, Ire, E I R E in Egyptian, means eye. So that's the land of the eye. And when you start again going to Osiris, the open eye, you start to get some connection. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've got Irish blood through it going through. Look, I've got Irish blood in me, mate. So, um, and I can feel it. So, and it's good. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to this because uh, I say I'm looking forward to this. I, I just mean, as I say, I'm I'm confident that I'm doing the right thing. Um. As I say, but I'm not prepared for what happens afterwards. I've just no idea. I'm getting this panic attack thing mm. that I had back at the millennium, where I think my life's just about to intimately be over, and <laughs> I'm getting that panicky way. You know, I'm just like, oh, much to do, much to do. Um, but I'm sure this will pass. This just this, this anxiety one. And when I, I watched something the other day, and it was talking about, you know, you need to just train your brain to say what I'm doing is perfectly natural. And it, it calms you down before, like, you know, if you were going to give a big talk or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I need to remember what I'm doing is just perfectly natural. I'm just an investigator. I found stuff out. I'm putting it out there. But again, like yourself, I'm primarily a, a witness to these things. I'm, 
I'm a witness. I, I'd like to see myself as a witness instead of an investigator or an author. Uh, I'd rather see myself as that ground, you know, boots on the ground guy. Um, so I've evolved over the last 20 years, as I say, for, you know, eyewitness to researcher, to author, um, to, to contactee, mm. uh, finding out 20 years later. Um, so it's all very interesting, as I say. Um, I mean, what I've, um, what I've put, I'll be putting out in December is just, I find it hard to believe. And, um, I'll be doing another show with David soon about to, to talk more about it, but um, that's a secret. I was, I, You're giving a secret away now. Yeah? <laughs> no, no. But, um, no, I'm I just talking about how uh, you know David Dab was saying when I first got that, I I, I got an, an, I had to go and get an, an image professionally rendered, mm. and when I got it back, I actually got in touch with the, the guy that performed the rendering, and I went mental at him, and I'm like. Mate, you can't go doing this. I was like, this is this is not your own personal art project. I'm like, this is an official NASA photograph which is going out to the public. And the guy said to say to me, no, that's actually the rendering process that's taking place. He says, there's only so much you can do before you start making it up. He says, there's a fine line. He says, but that's the true representation of what's in that image. Mm. And my jaw hit the floor. And, I'm, and that was me. Uh, and I still, I had trouble uh, quantifying that for quite a while. But I ended up getting a, a second opinion done, and the second opinion came back, and it was the exact same thing that I'd been given off the first one. So I repeated the experiment under different conditions, and I got it back, and it was just mind-blowing. And as I say, I, I, now I'm quite comfortable with it, because I've been sitting on top of this now for five months, um, six months come December. Um, so it's an everyday occurrence for me, but um, I still have trouble with it, you know. Um, but I still find that now I'm now I find it fascinating. But uh, I'm sure that when I put it out come December, that everybody else out there is going to have trouble with it, um, especially NASA, ESA, and <laughs> say <laughs> the Pentagon. Um, so we'll wait and see what happens. But yeah, I'm, uh, as I say, I've no idea what's going to happen after that. Um, but I feel uh, I've played out my role in life. Once I get this book out, I'll be quite happy to uh, retire from ufology. You know, <laughs> I don't. I don't <laughs> think you. I don't well, think you I think will. The, I think, think ufology is going to have to retire after. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's the what's the title of this book going to be, James? I think you told me once before. What's, what's the title of this book going to be? This new one is going to be corroborated evidence, the discovery of the millennium. Yeah, because your previous one was corroborating in evidence, wasn't it? Corroborating evidence, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I just thought, oh, well, we'll just go with corroborated because <laughs> I've, I've, it's, it's a full deal now. As I say, I didn't realise for all the years that I was studying blue white oval UFOs, I was actually looking at a big spotlight on one of these big triangular things um, and I've not realised that for years so it's now hit, now when that hit me in June I was able to join all the dots and connect all sorts of stuff together and uh, it's going to be quite a package that I'm putting out this year so basically I'm opening Pandora's box and I'm letting the cat out of the bag so uh, and that's 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 it finished. Yeah, sounds like it's uh, going to be one to look out for, and I guess it will be on Amazon, will it, Jim? James? I'm hoping to get it up on uh, Amazon, uh, Kindle Direct, um, but again, I'm going to try and get it done as a uh, print on demand. Right, okay. Uh, but I've no idea what the costing is going to be at the moment. I think it's going to be uh, somewhere up there in the region, or maybe 30 quid, maybe 40 As much as that, oh, right. Book. It's going to be quite a big... Um... I don't know, I'm not too sure. Uh, until such times, I'm going to be getting in touch by HarperCollins again, to see if they're, they're still interested in it. Um, they gave me some initial interest earlier on in the year. But um, if they're going to take it on, then brilliant. I don't need to worry about um, costings too much by print. Mm. Uh, because it is, there's, there's, there's maybe 50 images in this book. Um because there's so much breakdowns going on with images and interpretations and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's a very audio, it's a very visual book um, with a lot of imagery. So, but and a lot of information packed into it as well. So 
I'm hoping that I've done a good enough job uh, trying to condense and trying to convey the all the the, the path it took me to Adam. Hmm. I mean, I'm glad I brought you two together because I thought it's been very very interesting. I, I, I like to talk more about Egypt maybe sometime me um, because obviously I don't want to go into too much on air. Um, but yeah, I mean. Um, um, th- th- another thing I discovered this year was the scarab beetle, uh, and I realised that um, it, it seemed, it appeared to me to represent um, an opposing magnetic current. Um, so I, I, I think there was more symbology. There's, there's, you know yourself. There's so many levels of symbology going mm. on with Egyptian hieroglyphs, but there's also a, a, a language that's there on every single temple in Egypt that's mm. there for everybody to see and they cannot see it and it's a technological language and it's right there in front of everybody and that's back to what you were saying about keeping all this quiet and, um, but there's, there's definitely a technological language expressed in Egypt and, uh, and Mayan as well and as I say, I think they had the electricity um, going way, way, way back. Um, they were a lot more organised uh, than, than we're told, you know. Um, I mean, hi- hi- hieroglyphs are not just visual, they're, they're touch. When, when, when you touch a hieroglyph, it is passing information to your energetic field. Uh, so most people make the mistake of just looking. You know, where when you when you talk about electricity, that's mm-hmm. extremely important because... You know, with electricity, you know, the, these ancient races were able to, to implode electricity on, uh, on themselves and become sort of a conscious black hole and move from one part of the universe to the other. And they were doing that by electricity. When, when you look at Genesis to Revelation, Genesis is the genitals where the body electric begins and the revelation is when it gets to the mind and it reveals ancient secret knowledge so genesis to revelation is basically relating from from the beginning of the journey to the end which is the the exodus of moses so all of these things you know are are very very secret the one the one thing I, i'm picking up with your book james is is the one thing that's going to annoy people is the very fact that it's going to make them realize how far beyond they are in in terms of the information that they're putting out because what they're doing is they're all arguing amongst themselves within lower circles. And when a new level of information comes out, it makes them realise just how far how far behind you know, the, the race they really are. There's one, every, every single community, you know, whether it's UFO, whether it's paranormal, whether it's ancient, whether it's religious, whatever, there, there is always the groups of people within these communities that believe that they have all the answers and they know everything. And when it's pointed out to them that they don't, or perhaps they don't, that's when they start getting a little bit of annoy, annoyance with you. There's one example. There's one example where my, my, my wife and I went to Birmingham City Centre because we wanted to do a video on the on the impact of that. Everywhere you look, everything you do, everything you see when you go to these shopping malls is advertisements. Literally everywhere you look. And, you know, we went into the psychology and the subconsciousness of, of that as well. But we decided we wanted a song on that video. And because we were talking about advertising, we chose not not, as it, not because we liked the song, but it matched. You know, we sang, uh, we, we had Robbie Williams advertising space, that song, because we were talking about advertising space and it was the perfect match for the video. David Icke got hold of it and put it onto his, his newsletter. So, of course, within... Within hours, there was, there was thousands and thousands of hours. <laughs> and what was everybody arguing over? Not not the message. They were arguing over Robbie Williams. <laughs> and who liked, <laughs> who liked him and who didn't. <laughs> now, these are so-called enlightened people. Yeah. Yeah. And they completely missed the message and they were arguing over Robbie Williams being crap or Robbie Williams <laughs> being great. <laughs> Everybody's arguing within circles, and, and, and one thing that your book will do, James, is just show them how far off the pace they really are. So, yes, you know, the, the, the ancient thing is my thing. Uh, the downloaded information that I get about 
and piece together a complete blueprint of the whole of the ancient world and off-planet civilizations. And it is really a treasure to, to know these things. So whatever you know, you know, you have a duty to put out there. And if people don't like it, we'll end tough. That's not my... That's not that's I mean, uh, just what you're saying there, um, what was it, uh, just to, just what you're saying about being it and advertising and all that, this is uh, pretty much, I'll, I'll give you a little introduction to the start of my new book, and it's exactly what you're saying. Um, I mean, I made no bones about it, I've stole this, I've completely lifted it for another guy, um, but I'm, I'll, I'll credit the guy for it, so he's, he's well known. It's uh, Irvin Melsh, the guy that done Trainspotting. So I've... Uh, you know, it was inspired by him, so uh, it's called UAP Spawn. And it goes like this. Choose to accept there's no corroborated evidence that aliens exist and are visiting Earth. Choose to sleep, consume, reproduce, pay taxes and obey. Choose to be distracted. Choose to remain in ignorance. Choose to be uneducated. Choose to accept what you're being told. Choose to accept excuses like lens flares, reflections, space debris and ice crystals. Choose to believe SETI, NASA, and ESA. Choose to believe they've found no evidence of life in the universe. Choose to be choose if it's going to be 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years before they announce that they've found microbes. Choose to believe the UAPTF conclusions or in the Pentagon report. Choose to believe we're the only ones out there in the expanse of the cosmos. Choose to believe that it's too far for the aliens to get here. Choose to believe the night vision scope of a triangle that the US Navy confirmed is real. Uh, of a of a commercial airliner as of a genuine UFO. Choose to believe SETI director Jill Tartler when she says finding aliens will be like holding a mirror up to ourselves and seeing ourselves looking back. Choose to believe SETI astronomer Seth Shoshak when he says there is no conspiracy to keep secrets in science. I chose not to accept the word of the British Ministry of Defence, ESA, NASA, SETI, the US Navy, the UAPTF or the Pentagon report. I chose something else. I chose to study this subject for myself. <laughs> so that's that's for me. Some, some someone once said to me when I was talking about, you know, if, if you ever if you ever wish to to come across opposition, you know, tell 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 people in a Christian arena that Christ never existed. Try telling people in ufology about the Anunnaki story is, is fraud. If you if you want to come up against some resistance, but somebody once said to me that. You're a bit arrogant, aren't you? You know, do, so everybody's been brought upon a lie except for you. I said, now I was brought upon the same lie, but I saw through it. Hmm. Yeah, because there's a lot of stuff that I'm not uh, publishing this year. I'm going to hold it back for another book, but I'll, I'll send you over and let you have a look at it. To say, I found it fascinating. So. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you never know. Maybe in a few months' time, we'll get you both back on again once your books come out, and we can discuss what's actually been put out by you. And also, yeah, we, we, also, we, Michael, you've got we, a book that's just come out recently as well, haven't you? Well, I, I'm I'm sort of writing two simultaneously, but I started them twelve months ago, and I'm I'm I've since sort of found out that the the books that I started with will not be the books that I end with because the yeah 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 yeah. yeah. So, so thick and fast and deep right. that it's uh, taking yeah. in a completely new sort of direction. So we'll have to sort of wait and see uh, in relation yeah. to that. But you know, we we, we all face the uh, you're going to burn in hell from the love, you know, the, the love of Christ, people. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> just yourself to heaven. Oh, yeah. So there you go. Yeah, I'll be a one deep man after this. I'm going to be the Salman Rushdie. Are you forward to? <laughs> so so you'll be you'll both be facing your own demons anyway soon, sir. So. Aye, so on. Bring him on. What is that? <laughs> right. Yeah, Aye, the, oh, the word demon means genius. So there you yeah. go. <laughs> oh, think, think of a word. Give it to Michael, and he'll give you the answer. <laughs> ah, well, that's, uh, well I, I wrote at the start of this book as well that it's usually scientific geniuses that make all these discoveries. So basically, I guess I broke the mold. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wait a minute, you, know? <laughs> you, you, you must be a genie. <laughs> Genius. Oh, oh yes, we're that. Yeah, that's that one. As I say, when I, when I, mean. I found out what what I had my hands on, I broke down and cried. I got, I broke down and literally broke down in tears, and I was just overwhelmed with what I realised that uh, I now had in my hands and what I had to do. I was in tears. I was just like, oh my god, this is how this me of all people. This is how I could think was me of all people. 
over 20 years I've had, and then I've had this information out for like nine years it's been online mm. nobody's followed up on it nobody <laughs> nobody followed up on it nobody other people did follow up on it initially but they never get anywhere close to where I was and this is sat for all these years and I've been able to go back now and follow up on my own research and people have had ample opportunity to do this over all these years so this is what I can't understand is why it was me by ultimately it was me that found this and I, I just find that I've been chosen so there, there's a role in it somewhere there has to be there has to be some sort of methodology to all of this and you, you have been chosen you've been directed to it otherwise you wouldn't have found it and um, the, the, the most difficult question people ever ask me but it's a good one is how do you piece it together where do you get the information from because trying to explain to someone that you get a down, download where you have an answer, a, a question and the answer in the same bubble, in the same second. And it's extremely difficult to explain that to someone of how you've been able to, to piece everything together. Uh, yeah. It's difficult to explain to someone that, that can't, can't imagine that, you know, you get images, you get flashes, you get questions and answers in the same second. Mm-hmm. You just, it's, it's very, very difficult to explain. Yeah. I mean, I, that's the best way I put it to my sister earlier on this year when I was like, oh, look, I says, I'm getting things put in my head. And she's like, oh, what are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, look, images, just pictures, just flashing. Images, just rapid. Boom, 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 boom. And I, I says to her, I says, I felt as if I got a whole history of humanity thrown at me this year. And I was like, whoa, what's going on here? But again, were you talking about Anunnaki and all that? The Anunnaki, the Nephilim, all of it, all of it, every single bit of it is legit. It's all real, and I've, there's so much more that I've branched into this year that I've not covered in this book because I, I want to be taken seriously with regards to this particular investigation uh, and leave the other stuff, leave the cuckoo stuff aside, maybe for another book, you know, once once uh, once I get the time to do that. But um, again, as I say, um, it's, it's some of the stuff that, it's just cuckoo. You're just like, whoa, you know. As I said, like you said, downloads and answers and questions in the same moment. I mean, it was I, I was able to find something that's invisible. Do you know what I mean? How, how can you? How can that's that's. And again, what you're saying is trying to explain that to somebody is hard. So this is why I've put this book together to say, look, I need to have had to explain it all. It's, it might sound really mundane to the the, the reader. But as far as I'm concerned, I've done a good job of spelling out exactly how I was able to do all this. Uh, so I can be taken. But, you know, maybe people get a, a much clearer image of uh, where I'm coming from. It's not just a case of me pointing to something and saying that's that and that's that. You know, I've, I've got a whole methodology behind it. So we'll wait and see how it's received later this year. What, what you do is you, you set a new hide for the bar. And the, the, the people who are ready to jump that height will jump that height. But unless you have, unless you set something that is, that is higher, then people have nothing to aspire to or, or rise to. But that is how you, that is how you advance by, you know, going outside your comfort zone by by jumping higher than you've ever jumped before. But somebody has to go there first and and reset the height of the jump. And that's what a lot of these. You know, esoteric books are doing some some of the things that, that I write about some of the things that I put especially you know you can, you can pinpoint a, a change in frequency a change in, in, in information and the depth of information you can pinpoint it to seconds to, to minutes to days to weeks and I can distinctly know when there's been a change when something has changed when, when something is coming back at a deeper level and some of the things that I write and say there's not many people really that that can keep up with what I'm saying. That there's only really when when I've really really gone into depth. There's only one person that's ever been able to keep up as a host, and that was Richard C. Hoagland. He was the obviously the man who, who geometrically yeah. mapped Sidonian City. He's the only person who's been able to keep up out of all the hundreds and hundreds of radio shows that I've done. But there's only one person that's ever kept up, and that was him. Right. Hmm. Has has 
he's quite intense with his talks, isn't he? He's, he just yeah. opens his mouth and he's like, oh, he's brilliant. Uh, no, uh, no, I remember the, the, I, I, I read the, the Hancock book on Cydonia, uh, Message on Mars or whatever it was called, I'm not too yeah. sure. Um, and that was a good book. That was very interesting about all the, the geometry and all that that was going on over there. Um, and it just pointed to, to something else, you know. So like there was definitely, um, there's definitely something going on on a much more, uh, a larger cosmological scale than just Earth, you know. Um, and it's not just, um, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, science is coming to conclude now that, uh, Mars was, Earth-like at one point, you know, there's no doubt about mm. it now. Um, they're, they're quite happy to say, look, just give us millions and millions of dollars and we'll send astronauts to Mars to crack open rocks and we'll find microbes and then we'll discover there's life elsewhere in the universe. And my book is there to um, basically um, potentially save astronauts' lives. <laughs> That's the way I'm looking at it. I'm going, well, if I publish this, I mean, you know, I might save uh, a few astronauts going up there and Cacking it, you know. So, um, so I, I, but you never know. My book could potentially be saving lives, and that's that can only be a good thing. So, uh, if NASA want to, if not NASA want to look at the downside, then they can remember that, and hopefully that will keep our turn up, you know. But uh, yeah, um, as I say, I'm I'm putting this out. I'm terrified, but I'm really excited, and um. I just know it's got to be done. I mean, it's just one of the ones, you know, don't push a button, don't push a button, don't push a button. It's just like, I'm going to, I want to push that button, you know. So um, I can't wait to uh, just, you know, release the Bombay doors and uh, off it goes. And it's no my responsibility anymore, you know. <laughs> and then I can go and find a, a fallout shell. <laughs> and then you've got to come back with the other picture. Uh, <laughs> That's how I can set my fall out, my bunker. <laughs> <laughs> my bunker. Yeah, you'll have to put, you'll still, as I say, you've, you've got to stick your head out of the bunker to go and bring the other book out. <laughs> I know. God, when, oh, got myself into trouble last time <laughs> we made bunker jokes, eh? <laughs> Anyway, I, I think uh, we better leave it there because we're going to get a bit silly there. We uh, better talk about bunkers and things. And uh, <laughs> anyway, it's been great talking to you both. Thanks for coming on, and um, I, I hope you both got something out of that. Um, I did, you know, always do. But um, I hope you enjoyed it, Michael. Did you? I enjoyed it. It's different. Uh, it's a different interview, but yes, there's information that I, you know, I, I'm not not aware of. Uh, I hope it was of. different in a good way. It's different in a good way. It's, it's different uh, because there's there's more contributors. So yes, you, you always get if you speak to somebody that knows something you don't, then then it's only it only adds to you. That's right. And that's 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 a good thing. I ah, totally yeah man, oh, nice one. No, it's been nice and uh, I appreciate uh, having us be talking with you tonight because you're reminding me that see this is the thing I've been that cooped up on you for that long writing this book that. I'm forgetting about the wider world out there and, you know, all these uh, other things that are going on out there. So it'll be nice to rejoin the world soon enough and get a, hopefully get a bit of positive energy my way. Because uh, it, it'll be nice, you know. Um, but as I say, I've got Christmas wrapped up for everybody this year and um, I'm just hoping that it goes the way it's meant to go. Uh, but if it doesn't, it's only a mere proof that we're all being... Smothered and shepherded. Yeah, well, I think you'll um, find it will be that way, but um, hopefully, it, you know, you, enough people will get, you know, support you and get it out there. I'll do my best as I always do. Well, this is that. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is that. This is the thing as well. I mean, I'm only the one guy, but again, the, the likes of like your David Icke or your Richard Pope, and you never know who's going to pick this up mm. and go, wow, you know what I mean, and maybe take it somewhere else. I mean, I've been trying to speak to James Fox about it and say, look, Jamesy. Your next bloody documentary, do you know what I mean? Get yourself over to Glasgow, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, that's the next big thing, is there's going to be a documentary done. Um, and I'm I'm looking forward to getting that out. But um, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come here. I'm jumping, I'm counting my, count my eggs in one basket here, yeah. you know. Um, <laughs> Before they're hatched. We'll get the book out, and if the book's a success, and maybe people might want to know more about UFO sightings and... There might be a documentary further down the line, yeah. but um, I'll just be happy to get the book out and just to just to be finally done with 
endless format and then editing and um, just the closer it's getting to Christmas, the more panicky I'm getting. <laughs> Um, but I know I've got it covered. I know I've got it covered. I just need to relax and breathe and try and not do everything at once. So, uh, and I'm going to bear in mind what Michael's saying tonight with the cat with vibrations when I'm cuddling into my cat man, he's pulling away. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so aye, good, good vibes, Michael. Uh, good vibes. And I'm going, as I say, I'm going to try and not be too, too, uh, terrified about what's going to happen um, because you can't spend your whole life worrying about what's going to happen, you know what I mean? Yeah. What will happen will happen. So, yeah, um, we'll wait and see where it goes, but everything happens for a reason, as I mm. say. Well, uh, well, it's been my pleasure to introduce you to each other anyway, and uh, hopefully your your uh, communications will carry on. I and um, it's been a great pleasure having you on, and I suppose we better pull the plug now and uh, let, you, let you both go. Oh, I'm well, going to go to bed in a minute. I, I, you know, yeah. Talk, talk, talk. Thank you. I'll, I'll, no be, I'll be calling you Silla Black from now on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, yeah. anyway, thanks for gentlemen for coming on. Thanks, Michael. Oh, that's been lovely talking. And thanks, James. It's been lovely talking to you, Michael. Yeah. You take it easy, and I'll catch yeah. you soon. You yeah. take. Thank you. Well, man. take care of yourself. You take... Yeah. Cheers. Good night. Thank and thank you yeah, for really. listening, everybody. Well, you've been listening to Paranormal Dimensions on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I'm David Young. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Paranormal Dimensions is as bright and powerful as our celestial star, the sun. And although it's expending thousands of pounds of energy every minute of the day, have no fear. There's plenty left. Dimensions is fortnightly on Mondays on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. They're laughing at you. They're not laughing with you. Fine. I remember my daughter Kerry saying to me, you know, Dad, one day I'm going to be able to walk down Union Street. And I'm going to be able to say, my dad's not mad. Look at what he said. Look at what is happening. He was right. Oh, you're not a 
numbers um, walking through the London streets saying we're not having it anymore is it's so freaking emotional you know you know I've done some things in my life but um, you know this this is this is an incredible day for me to uh, to have seen uh, all those years ago those decades ago where no one wanted to know and uh, everything you said was crazy and now you, you see the world waking up on this scale. So, you know, the, the whole COVID um, era has uh, has been a, a, a fascistic nightmare, but it has woken people up to the fact that um, there are forces running human society that are not the people they see. And we have an opportunity now to, 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 to turn that seeing that into ceasing to cooperate with it and, and if the kind of numbers we're starting to see cease to cooperate with the dictats of authority and fascism then the numbers alone mean it cannot prevail so this is a, a fantastic pivotal day and, uh, yeah. and uh, a, a day that gives you enormous encouragement for where we go from here hey. Hey, how are you, man? Hi. Can I get a picture of you? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I love this. Thank you. How the police should be. I say wait and see. The coronavirus pandemic started in China. Oxygen, medical supplies, and hospital staff have continued. One of the five vaccines that we Stage one, you create a problem. It could be uh, a manufactured virus. You want a reaction and you want them to either say, do something, or you want them to accept what the authorities suggest must be done. So one of the agendas is to massively cull the population. They want to reduce the numbers. Stage one, you create a problem. It could be uh, a manufactured virus. You want a reaction and you want them to either say, do something, 
or you want them to accept what the authorities suggest must be done. So one of the agendas is to massively cull the population. They want to reduce the numbers.